Open our Bibles again, and this time right to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. We'll be reading from verse 1 through to verse 24. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. She took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So the Lord God asked the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, you will strike his heel. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labour pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And he said to the man, Because you listened to your wife, and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labour all the days of your life. It will produce thorns for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. The man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all the living, The Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. The Lord God said, Since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed a cherubim and the flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden, to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is our second week in Genesis chapter 3. And now more than ever we find ourselves asking the question, what's wrong with the world? More and more as we spin further down the rabbit hole that is covid We ask with increasing regularity, what's going on with the world? Didn't God make the world good? Why is it so full of bad things? What's wrong? Every time I turn on the news, I hear story after story of famine, plague, people behaving badly, and just general disappointment. It's getting harder and harder to keep watching the news when there's nothing good going on. And the Bible offers a unique answer to this question. The Bible says right at the start exactly what's wrong with the world and shows us exactly what God has planned in order to fix it. As I said, today we are focusing on the second half of chapter 3, but as we jump in 
Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you will open our ears to hear what you have to say, that we may understand it and apply it to our lives. Amen. Last week, we saw God's desire to dwell with his people and the length that he was willing to go to to ensure that he could dwell with his people forever. This week, we turn to the results of humanity's decision to remove the creator of the universe from the driver's seat of his own creation. What happens when we decide to replace God with ourselves? After the blame shifting that happened, Adam said, I didn't do it, it was the woman. The woman said, I didn't do it, it was the serpent. Well, now it's God's turn to speak. And he brings punishment for the rebellion that has occurred. Firstly, he turns on the snake and curses the snake. Last week I mentioned that the serpent was the tool of the devil. Why does he deserve to be punished Is he, if he is just a tool? Well, the thing is, the devil never forces us to do anything. The devil tempts, the devil suggests, but the Bible always holds the individual accountable for their own actions. Yes, the snake, the serpent was a tool, but that doesn't mean he holds no responsibility for his actions. And so he is cursed, just like the man and the woman. God turns to the woman and he curses her as well. And this curse is very revealing. There will be pains in labor and childbirth. You see, sin has affected our physical bodies. Things are not the way they were meant to be. The command of God to his people when they were first made was to fill the earth, multiply, make more and more people. But now, fulfilling that task will be filled with hardship, pain and toil. Our physical bodies are not what they were supposed to be. We are now subject to pain, death and decay. Sin has affected our bodies. But then, later on in verse 16, we get this statement. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. This verse is showing us that our sin has affected our relationships with each other. God created man and woman to work together in harmony to fulfill his, his rule in the world. But now, instead of a relationship of harmony, trust and love between the man and the woman, their relationship is broken and characterized by mistrust, deceit and hardship. So it's not just our physical bodies that have been affected by sin, but our relationships between each other and between the sexes have been destroyed by what sin has done. It has corrupted even these. Then God goes on to speak to the man. and the man, Because of what the man has done, the ground is cursed. How does that work? Well, the man was put in the garden to till the soil and to care for the garden, and now, fulfilling his God-given task, will be filled with hardship and toil, just like the woman. You see, it's not just our bodies and our relationships that are affected by sin. The very earth is affected by our sin. It too has been corrupted and changed. And so now, instead of producing life like it should, it produces thorns and thistles, and it is hard work to work the ground. God is the source of all life. He is the one who gives life and breath to everyone and everything. And so it is only logical that when we reject him, that suddenly bringing new life into the world through either childbirth or growing things in the ground suddenly becomes more difficult because we have lost our connection with the Creator who gives life. What do you think of when I say the word sin? More often than not, when I talk to people, 
They think sin is just the bad things we do, the rules we break. But here in Genesis 3, we see that the Bible says that sin is the cause of everything that is wrong with the world. You see, sin has affected everything. There is not one part of this good world that has not been affected by sin. It is more than just the bad things we do or the rules we break. It's the very air we breathe. It's a poisonous gas that spreads throughout the world and hasn't let up yet. Now, this doesn't mean that everything is horrible. This doesn't mean that there is nothing good in the world. There is plenty of good things in the world. But none of those good things are as good as they should be. They are not the way that God has made them. Our rebellion and our desire to kick God out of the driver's seat has meant that everything is broken. Everything has been affected by sin. And this is why we need a saviour because there is nothing we can do for ourselves to get rid of the sin that lies not just in our own hearts, but everywhere in the world. But here in Genesis 3, as it lays out what is wrong with the world, it also shows us that God has a plan. He has a solution. Have a look with me again at verse 15, when God is cursing the serpent. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Is this just talking about the fact that lots of people are afraid of snakes? Well, no, it's more than that. There is only one person who will strike the head of the the snake. He, one of Eve's children, will crush the serpent will destroy the reign of the devil and rescue God's people from their sin. Even here, right at the beginning, God is determined that he will make the world right again. Adam, the first man that he created, was put in the garden to tend the earth, to look after it. His job was to rule over the created world under God. But... Instead of ruling over the created world, he stopped listening to the creator and started listening to a creature. Sin is not some outside force that is staging an invasion against God's creation. It is a rebellion from the inside, the creatures trying to dethrone their king and install themselves. But God has a plan to stop it because he sent his son to live in the, in the world with us. God the Son stepped out of heaven and joined us in the dirt and muck and distress of life. And unlike Adam before him, this man did not rebel against his father's rule. He did not try to install himself as God. He lived a life that we were supposed to live, the life that the first Adam was supposed to live. And now, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the serpent's head has been crushed. His tyranny over the world has been ended. His grip has been lost. The problem of sin at the heart of of our human nature has been swept away by the death and resurrection of Christ. And that allows us to live in a manner that God calls acceptable. It all started in the garden. Eve took the fruit and ate. Then, later on in Matthew 26, while eating with his final meal with his disciples, Jesus takes those words, take and eat, and turns them from words of death to words of life. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. He then took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the new covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
This is why we are still doing the Lord's Supper, even though we're only meeting online. This is why we do the Lord's Supper as often as we can, because it reminds us that even when there was nothing that we could do to get rid of the stain of sin on our lives, God has already done it for us. The death and resurrection of Christ is the start of God's plan to remove sin from the world, to make everything right again. God is giving us a new heart. But giving people a new heart is a long process. We are not there yet. We are not perfect. And we won't be until the day that Jesus comes again. And so we still face the trials and temptations that come with living in a broken world. But now, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, God enables us to make wise choices, to live for him instead of ourselves. Even when it is hard, he is with us, and he is making us more and more into the children that he wants us to be so that we will be fully ready to live with him when Jesus returns. And that's all well and good for the sin that is in our lives, but I said that everything was affected by sin. What's God's plan to fix the world, to fix the sin that is not just in me but in everything? Well, Paul puts it like this in Romans 16. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The serpent will be crushed. God will remove all sin from the world. This is why we read Revelation 22 in our Bible readings, because it says something amazing. Have a look with me again at verses 2 and 3. Down the middle of the broad street of the city, the tree of life was on both sides of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations and there will no longer be any curse. When Jesus returns, the curse will be done away with. Our sin will be finished. The world will be made right again. When Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, they were removed so that they could not access the tree of life. God would not allow Adam and Eve to live forever in their sin and rebellion against him. But when Jesus returns, access to the tree of life is granted again, freely available to any who live in the city with God. The curse is removed. God will make things the way they are supposed to be. He is coming. God's plan for the future is a total reversal of the humanity's actions in the garden. And we're invited to live with him there because of what Jesus has done for us. All the things that sin has wrecked will be put right. Our relationships with each other and with God will be restored. Our physical bodies will be renewed to what they were meant to be. The creation will be made new. The curse will be removed. So what's wrong with the world? The Bible's answer is sin. Sin has affected and distorted every part of the world we live in. And so when you find yourself looking out at the world and saying, this just isn't right, the Bible doesn't chastise you for saying that. It agrees with you. The Bible says, yes, the world is not right. It is not the way it should be. But God has a plan and it will be made right again. And the problems of this world feel like they are too much to bear. When you don't know how to deal with everything that's going on, remember, God will bring them to an end. God is making the world and us new, and he will bring us to live with him in a world where there is no longer any curse. When you are overwhelmed by your sin, Just remember, Jesus has died for you and by his Holy Spirit, God is working in you to make you more and more into the child that he wants you to be. Call out to him when you are overwhelmed and he will answer you and give you comfort. 
God was willing to die for you. He is willing to help you when it is too much. And when you feel like you will never be good enough for God, when you could never earn your way into his good books, remember, you don't have to. Jesus has already done everything required to bring you back to the God who created you. You don't need to feel paralyzed by fear. God is with you. He has sent his son to die for you, to remove the stain of sin on the human heart so that you could come to him, no longer as his enemy, but as his beloved son or daughter. God is making us into his true children. He is restoring the world to the way it should be. Yes, sin has affected everything, but that does not mean there is no hope. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and we thank you that you have always had a plan to make the world right again. And we pray that you will comfort us with this knowledge and bring us safely into your kingdom when your son returns. Amen.